Hello, uh, friends of the internet. I, uh, my name's Austin from Austin B Media. Uh, I am here today in f the uh, first of my Slam Dance interviews um, with uh, Mark Shapiro um, for, for the movie, the documentary Downwinders, which it, uh, not Downwinders, that's the term you use. The documentary is called Downwind, and it's about um, well, it's it's basically about among other things, the Nevada test site, how that, um, well, I'll let you, um, talk a little bit about it. Um, how would you describe this, Mark? So Downwind is a film that details, uh, the 928 nuclear detonations that took place at the Nevada test site from 1951 to 1992. And basically I think it's kind of a, uh, when we when we mentioned that number, I think people are sort of taken aback, as we were when we initially started in, on this project. Um, you know, we we're we're entering into this. We entered into into this documentary. What goes up must come down. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the radiation, the radioactive materials that came from each one of those detonations impacted someone downwind, and ultimately, the conclusion of our film is we are all downwinders because of the way that the radiation sort of travels in the atmosphere. Um, so we wanted to raise consciousness and to have people take note of what what what, had, what happened during the Cold War that continues to impact people to this day. Yeah, and I think we're just now starting to talk about these kind of things where I know, I, I guess the popular thing would have been the HBO show Chernobyl um, that really everyone latched on to. Um, but with that, I I, I want to ask how, what kind of what how did you get started on the idea to make Downwind? What really inspired you and um, Douglas, who's the co-director, um, to direct this movie? Um, what inspired Doug and I initially, we we both had cancer impact our families, um, not Downwind cancer specifically that we know of, but cancer which impacts everyone if you walk down the street and ask somebody everybody's been impacted by cancer um and we wanted to shine a light on something that was unique um because it was sort of a traceable form of cancer from we talked about the again the detonations of the, of the nevada test site we wanted to find out what who was impacted by by the detonations uh, like i said what goes up comes down um and we dug deep into you know sort of ground zero which was the nevada test site which is about an hour from las vegas and um the impact that it had to people that were east due east of of the detonations mm -hmm. and we did we came across um a john wayne film that was produced by howard hughes called the conqueror and that film sort of to us almost served as a petri dish of potentially what was impacting people from all those detonations. And if you take a look at the cast and I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna try to take myself out of this and just look at the facts. If you take a look at the cast and crew on the film, The Conqueror, there was a tremendous number of death by cancer um, attributed potentially yeah. to the nuclear detonations. So it's something we kind of dug into. Yeah, I think if I'm remembering from the documentary, I think it, it said af out of a cast, including below the line, out of 220 people that went from California to the um, filming site, I think it said 100 of those um, people involved with the production ended up uh, ha having some kind of cancer. Right. And a lot of it was attributed to what was called a detonation or a, a, they called the detonation shots and devices. They use interesting terms. The government used interesting yeah. terms. Um, there was a there was a blast or a, a shot called uh, called Harry. Each 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 detonation had a name. This one was called Harry, and that was detonated um, about a year before the cast arrived to film The Conqueror in, in a place called Snow Canyon, Utah. And um, to your point, um, I think the number that Mark Sennett from People Magazine, who broke the story, um, said it was it quoted those numbers that you mentioned. And it was hard. It's hard to pinpoint um, downwind cancer downwinder cancer because it's not like a car accident that you see in front of you or a tornado that's tangible 
this is something obviously that that travels and moves with time. Americans tend to move around uh, the country. It's a moving it's a moving target, so so to speak. And we we're basically trying to again sort of raise consciousness about about um, accountability for that that many blasts during the Cold War. Nine hundred and twenty eight was was a large number. Eight hundred and twenty eight of those nuclear tests were conducted underground. So, but these are detonations that sometimes were felt as far away as, as towns and cities in California, like San Francisco, and Los Angeles, yeah. um, where they could feel, you know, these these incredibly powerful detonations. Um, but each one of those underground detonations uh, has a prompt massive venting, it's called, which is a a way that the 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 gases actually flow into the atmosphere after a test. But yeah. one hundred of those were those big mushroom clouds that people are more familiar with, and uh, those the above ground testing um, was stopped at a certain point. There was sort of a worldwide um, agreement that they were that they would stop the above ground detonations, but the below ground detonations continued all the way until 1992, which we thought was surprising um, given that most people, when they're aware of nuclear testing, think of uh, Alamogordo, uh, you know, New Mexico as yeah. being, or the Manhattan Project as being the big, the big thing. So again, that, that was, uh, uh, awe inspiring we thought this is this is incredible it, it's what got us to kind of dig deeper into the topic yeah and um speaking on that um there's certain points where uh, at least i guess in the opening where the documentary almost has this horror movie aspect to it at certain points so um can you talk a bit about how you and douglas approach that in the director's chair well, we felt like a lot, you know, that you you mentioned what you mentioned, and and it is something that's that's sort of unique when you when you take a look and see the soldiers standing there marching near Ground Zero um, at the Nevada test site. We we show a bunch of soldiers marching, and then and it's black and white, and then you see the detonations of the nuclear blast, and you see soldiers literally standing, you know, next to this big radiation cloud of you know the mushroom club, and it does it does. It does look like that to us. And actually, we had animator Bill Plimpton, who's an independent animator, probably one of the most incredible independent animators in, in, in the world. We were so lucky to have him Oscar nominated. He created the 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 uh, breakage of DNA sort of in a in a in a, a magical way, which was both scary and uh, beautiful at the same time, the his animation. And I think in some ways maybe that's what you're seeing. Um and the music, I think, and I, I think we let our, uh, the newsreels that we used, you know, we used uh, things that came from the D U.S. Department of Defense that created, sort of the narrative of the Cold War. They created thousands of films, and and we're showing some of those films, and I think that's where you're getting the feel of of an ominousness that sort of prevails in the opening of the film. Yeah. So, did he do the opening credits? Yeah, the, the if you see the animation, you can see uh, Bill Plimpton's work. Uh, he had he did these spinning globes that showed all the different uh, major detonations and also um, accidents like at Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. And so we highlight that a little bit with these spinning globes and mushroom clouds or explosions. And in that sense, it is very ominous to your point. And um, our what was our goal? It wasn't to make it, you know, we, we wanted just to, to be true to the story. And so if it comes to you as something that is, um, that, that brings pause, then, then we've succeeded. Cause I think we, but we just wanted to show the facts. I, I one other thing you asked me about when we, when we came to this story, we were hoping that we would be able to showcase this film in theaters and have people that are Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians, millennials, Gen X, everybody kind of in the same spot looking at, cause we're all, we're all Americans or, or worldwide global citizens um, could sort of look at this and make their own um, assumption as to uh, what, what was the power of being a global superpower or what was the, what, I'm sorry, what was the, um, what's the responsibility? What was the outcome of being a global superpower? And so hopefully that came across. No, it, it did. I think, um, and this is actually a perfect segue to my next question. Um, but I I want to say that um, I wasn't 
even going to ask about the animation, so I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> because yeah. I was like, do I ask about the intro? Is that a weird question to ask? But I'm glad you brought it up. Um, but uh, talking about the research, um, I think when you're watching the documentary, it comes as a matter of fact kind of thing where it's like, okay, here are the facts. Here's well, We're just going to show you what went on from the people who have experienced it one way or another. And so I would love to know, um, obviously you probably did thousands upon thousands and thousands of hours of research on this. And I was wondering, what did you learn from that research that I, I think um, that people might not know about radioactive fallout? Um. I think, first of all, when we were doing the research, and you're right, every every new, every new tech, you know, direction that we went brought a new, a new interesting story. A new there were there were facts all over the place that we learned. Some were very coincidental. Um, we learned a lot about um, Lookout Mountain Lab, which was this incredible Hollywood studio. No one knows existed, and they created thousands of newsreels and footage about the cold war, everything from, you know, the duck and cover things that you may have heard about, mm -hmm. you know, from, from our parents and parents, parents, who's the generations where they, they grew up hiding under desks and things like that. And, um, we learned about that. We learned about the, the narrative of the cold war, cold war story. We also learned, which is really interesting to us. Uh, Doug and I are very, you know, we, we love this country. Um, but we also feel like it's important to take, take it to task sometimes when there when there's when there have been injustices so you know we were also we were we were hoping that people again i keep using the term raising consciousness about this i just don't think you could you could ask it's it's uh, this topic of the atomic detonations on our on you know american soil is something that that is um not typically discussed i don't think people know a lot about it and so it's a great question. What do we learn? We learned so much in the research. The other thing I'll say is there were a lot of coincidences that happened in our research where um, our main character, you know, the, the, the plot, the, the, the folks that we interviewed in our story were all interconnected. And we had no idea yeah. that Mary Dixon knew Claudia Peterson, who knew Ian Zabarte, who knew Martin Sheen, who was obviously connected to Michael Douglas and Lewis Black. They, you know, these all came separately because we, we wanted to get the most important people involved in this topic together in one place. So um, that was another, as, as we were doing research, um, we, we came across so many things that seemed coincidental, but I don't think it was coincidence. I think there is this sort of uh, connectivity that we all have, again, as global citizens. And, and the stories of the things we read and Hollywood, you know, the other thing is when we, when we started to dig into the, the Conqueror film, which in addition to being, um, uh, there were so many, there were so many uh, issues with the film itself, John Wayne playing Genghis Khan. And, you know, the, 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 the use of uh, Shivwit Native Americans to ride horses, they hired a bunch of them because they, I, I think, you know, three or $4 a day to have them ride horses all day. And there was a lot, there were like, it was a, sort of a big Hollywood story. And we felt like, um, John Wayne was represent a representative of a um, iconic American, brash, brazen, manifest destiny. He is he is America, and the fact that that potentially he was you know a, a victim of of the atomic blast was something that we we looked into, um, and you know there were a whole slew of stories that came out. Did America kill John Wayne? Which we thought was interesting because John Wayne is America, so it's yeah. almost like its own little thing that came full circle yeah and it, it it was interesting because i'm like why do they keep bringing back to the conqueror and then you get to the point where it's like oh yeah they shipped like the dirt from the set um into uh paramount pictures i think it's called now but uh RKO uh, yeah. at the time exactly um, yeah we found we found that fascinating we re read that in a lot of our research there um there was a, there have been books written about um, the film, The Conqueror, and sort of this doomed Hollywood production. And I did think that was interesting. They brought, they trucked back thousands of tons of dirt to 
um, to the studio for, you know, interiors to match. They wanted the, the red soil to match. And then Patrick Wayne in the movie says they went back to the site with Geiger counters and that that red dirt on set, you know, as you know, 20 years ago was still was still paying those those Geiger counters. So it is it sort of becomes a Hollywood story. They literally and maybe ironically, they 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 took the dirt, you know, upwind almost, you know, like where they. Yeah. You know, we, we're we're talking about downwind, but that that's how things you know it can be transferred back. We don't know where that red dirt is now, by the way. That that could be a whole other uh, story to look at. Well, I hope it's not there anymore because, <laughs> I mean, ten thousand year half life. Uh, if yeah. people are still filming on that set, I don't know if that's the safest environment. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I, um. I want to talk a little bit more about research because I love uh, research in documentaries. And I think there's a lot that doesn't go into a documentary because maybe it's not seen as maybe it's just fringe knowledge or outside information that really doesn't help the narrative along. Um, so what is, what did you have to cut from your research that, um, and this is along the same lines as my previous question, but I always love to know if there's any bit of research that you found fascinating that isn't in the documentary. Uh, one thing that I think is one of the, there were several several things that didn't make it to the film. Um, unfortunately, there's there are so there are so, there so many stories and branches that we could go on. But one thing that I did find interesting was the Look I'm Out in Lab to me was was a fascinating place um and you can you can look it up i think it's lookoutmountain.org um and it's a studio that was in hollywood and laurel canyon and they employed i, I mentioned before they employed um, folks from disney they employed um hollywood a-listers to kind of um help with the with the cold war narrative so what i found fascinating about that was their department of defense um, and atomic energy commission was a part of what i would say what we're trying to shine a light on, you know, it wasn't just the nuclear blast, but it was, it was sort of the machine of, of information around the nuclear um, testing. And so, uh, you know, at the time, investigative journalists, uh, you know, weren't, weren't looking into it as much because, you know, there were the propaganda, what we're calling propaganda films, but they really served as cold war narratives. So I, we felt like that, that's uh, another interesting topic that we're looking into um, and it's still there. The studio is still in existence. It's a private residence hmm. now up in Laurel Canyon. I think it's a five acre space. That was one thing that was that that stood out. But then there are also other stories. You know, you could look at um, all the stories of the individuals in the film who devoted their lives to the cause, like Ian Zabarte, um, who's principal man of the Western bands of the Shoshone Nation of Indians, is central to the story because the test site is located on um, Shoshone Nation um, land. It is literally deeded. There is a deed that says this land belongs to Shoshone Nation. And, you know, the test site is there. It's still operational. That's surprising. That's another thing I found surprising that, um, you know, we, we've gone down and we show in the film, we drive up to the gates of the test site and the guards come out immediately with, with guns. And, um, you know, you're not welcome on this land. It's restricted because it's, you know, we're, it's still in operation. Um, hmm. The other thing that, that was surprising to me was that um, some Congress, folks in Congress um, are talking about pot potentially resuming testing again at the, at the Nevada test site, which, you know, again, for the reasons we point out may not be the most, uh, you know, not not the wisest decision to be doing it now, especially given what we know. That was surprising. Um, so there were there were a number of of other angles that we could look at from our research. Yeah, and um, and yeah, I, I I think you know you talk about Ian. Um, there's a section. There's actually two sections of the film that are really interesting that I didn't know. Um, that on that land that the the government took. Um, they were doing, um, the, you know, they had to name these, uh, tests and he goes throughout a list of test names and they were naming it after tribes. Um, I believe, I, I, I think just other tribes, I don't think it was necessarily Shoshone. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, 
but there uh and then uh under a death valley sign it says like home of the shoshone or something like that um and i'd love if you if you'd like to um to talk a little bit more about the shoshone um presence throughout the documentary we had several days of filming with ian that were remarkable he's 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 quite an interesting person just a uh, super um, knowledgeable individual knows knows everything about the land. You know, was pointing things out as we're driving along and looking at things. Um, he's obviously um, a, a rep it represents the community, and so you know his his and and other folks that we talked to. We talked to Darlene Graham also, who's a Shoshone Nation. Um, she's a nurse, but also a healer who witnessed the testing. Um, so we spent we spent a lot of time with the end. Um, and learned a lot about the land, learned a lot about the um, the impact it had. <clears throat> Darlene talks about, in the film, she talks about how um, that's their land, you know, that's that's where medicine comes from, their food, their, you know, their animals graze on that land where they're not allowed to go there. They get arrested. They would get arrested on their own land. Imagine hmm. walking into your own neighborhood and, and being arrested for, you know, not being able to go into your own house. So um, we, we became... You know, Ian, Ian is, is someone we're, we were hoping that we could tell that story. It was another goal for our film was to really make a film that just gave the facts, gave the information and, and let let Ian, let Claudia, let um, Mary tell their stories about, you know, how it was how it was impactful. Um, to your point about the the naming of every, every one of the tests, every every one of them, 920 tests did have a name and. Ian goes, like you said, he goes through the listing of names and and the disrespect he felt that they would that they would name things after, um, you know, native cultures and groups was was apparent. And he's obviously very emotional about it. We went down to the test and we took him right up to the gates and he's he's angry, not at the, you know, the security that was there. They they were accommodating. You know, we didn't get arrested, you know, we, but we stayed we stayed on the, the line where we didn't cross we didn't cross the line there is a, literally a line we didn't go across that line we would get arrested but you know the, the disrespect that he feels not only you know by by the fact that like you said they they by by the names themselves giving each one of the test names and in a in a sense sort of um um underplaying the importance of what of what's going on in their own land and calling it that was was something that they felt was was incredibly disrespectful and you know ian is ian is positive though he's he is he is a change maker he wants things to change you know he's not looking at himself as a victim he wants to be a part of the future a, the part of the, the the changing of the guard the the new the new thinking to, because he talks a lot about water and how important water is especially in the desert and yeah. um he he wants it to be known that the water is something that not only gets um, impacted by radiation, but carries radiation faster through, you know, through the, through the, the territory that really is Shoshone land. Yeah. I think there's a segment where he's pointing at a map and he's, there's this river that um, connects the whole area. Um, I forget what it's called. Um, Armagosa, the Armagosa river. Yeah. The Armagosa river. And he's saying basically, if it hits here, um, it can contaminate this whole area, all of our land. Um, and there was a really nice bit where he um, was talking about, "Hey, just stop and listen really quick to the frogs. Yeah, that they're a really good indicator of the water quality." And um, that 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 was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I. I I hope that doesn't happen um, because that would be awful. Um, so I guess my question would be, what can we do? Um, what, what action items could we take uh, after the documentary? That's a great, great question. It's something that's really important to us. We, we actually, on our website, we list, um, organizations that can help with with the cause one thing awesome. that is um a, is is as out there's uh, an act called RICA, radiation exposure compensation act so the act um 
was basically passed to help people that prove that they're that they're downwinders can in proof in documentation in writing prove that they that their cancer or other illness um, resulted directly from fallout. If you can prove that, then they they offered a fifty thousand dollar lump sum um, that's given to you at one time to cover medical expenses. And you know, we learned through our own medical system that fifty thousand dollars really doesn't cover a lot of um, you know the, the best radiation care or best cancer care that you can get. It's a start, and I think they recognize that as a start. Unfortunately, RICA only is applicable in um, remote counties of three states in Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. And I think it's, it's, it is 22 counties of, of those states. So um, a couple of our folks in the film who are downwind, uh, identify as downwinders um, live in different parts of Utah that are not covered by this act. So the hope is that the act will be, will RICA will expand and not only to more states. I mean, you, in New Mexico where Alamogordo happened, you know, Trinity, um, New Mexico is not officially covered by RICA. Um, and lots of people all throughout, you know, all those states I mentioned and, and beyond, beyond just those three states. So the call to action would be, you know, to, to help support the causes that we've listed our website, which is backlotdocs.com um, or downwinddoc.com, either one. Um, it, it lists out a number of places that that you can go to support, you know, to to help support the cause and to help RICA, expansion of RICA, and also to maybe contact your government, you know, you're someone, a member of Congress to talk about, you know, the resumption of testing in my state is not a good idea if you feel that way. And um, we we have a link on our website that'll take you right to any, any Congress person's email address. Um, the other thing I, I do wanna mention is we, at the end of the film, we list a number of Congress that did not want to be interviewed for this film. Um, which we thought was interesting, especially during a during a an election. It, it was a period of election for some of them, um, and you know we contacted them. We you know we asked them. You know, can you give us your statements, your thoughts? And that went across lines, not just Republicans, Democrats too. So we wanted the folks in those states to know who declined requests to be interviewed. And some of some of them on the list were actually ones that have brought up the idea that potentially resumption of testing is 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 important to help us um as we as we advance into the next into the next generations yeah i'll make sure i uh list all those websites in the description of the video and the article um Great. but um besides that um let's see uh anything else you want people to know before we head out no i just i just i really appreciate you um and people taking the time it's an important topic. It's something that impacted our parents, our parents' parents, grandparents, um, and that when we talk about DNA, the what can happen with uh, restructuring of DNA it impacts future generations. So, um, as you as you saw in the film, Claudia Peterson's family has been devastated by um, by this, and and it's you know it's it's marked you know all the way down from her parents, all the you know to her daughter, to her um, her family members that were impacted by by this that are continuing to this day. I think it's really important, um, obviously, for everyone to take a stand as Americans. We're all, you know, our constitution wants us to take the country to task when when things aren't, aren't great. And this is a way that we feel like, um, you know, it's something we can do to help, uh, again, raise consciousness, consciousness about what's happened um, and what continues to happen and that we don't make you know the same mistakes we're up to present day you know we talked to michael douglas and lewis black and everyone in, in our film who brought up putin and you know and the war on that's happening in ukraine and you know there's nuclear power plants and there's you know there's things that are that are in the wake of all you know in the in the, in the fighting and we just have to recognize that it's not we we we, we have one planet obviously yeah. And the most important thing is to, to take care of, take care of it. And um, we feel like every generation should be impacted by this and should, should frankly be pissed off about what's happening and be part of, be part of change. And that's that to us is showing the, the, the best levels of activism and, and patriotism. Um, patriotism, the word patriot has a potentially a negative connotation. Sometimes people think of 
January 6th, the insurrection. But being a patriot also is speaking your mind or being an activist and helping support and sustain this constitution, which we're all so, you know, we're all happy to be, Amer you know, uh, as an American, I'm thrilled to be here. But again, I think it's it's important that we take our country to task when when things when things go awry and we're we we're all part of this. Yeah, for sure. Um, those interested in seeing downwind uh, can see it for really cheap. Um, I think if you see it virtually, um, a pass is like seven dollars. Uh, so it's really uh, economical for people to see it. I'll make sure a link is in the description. Um, and Mark, it looked like you wanted to say something there. Oh, I was just, just going to say, we're actually not screening virtually through Slam Dance, but oh, we okay. do have the spotlight screening at Slam, Slam Dance, which we're thrilled about January 23rd in Park City. And if people can make it, I don't know when this when this airs, but we're going to have a panel with the Downwinders, with Ian and Mary and Claudia um myself and co-director doug miller um will be there on this panel and to talk about what to do next what are next steps and we really want to shake up we really want to shake up park city we want to be the big deal in park city just like every other film and yeah. um we we want to make some noise there we want people to understand what's happening and um it's a really uh, there's a lot going on in park city but i feel like we feel like we have the most powerful film um in the festival, not just our festival, but any festival in Park City, and with an incredible number of films, by the way, then we're 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 really honored to be really honored to be a part of it. Yeah, well, I hope uh, people who are in Park City see it. Uh, I know there's another film festival with dance in the name that starts also starts with an S. Uh, but hey, if you're in Park City, go check it out. Um, I also think in-person tickets are really cheap. I don't know the number off the top of my head. Uh, but go check it out. I'll have links to everything uh, mentioned in the description, including a trailer for the film uh, and the annotations on the YouTube video somewhere. Uh, and then uh, until our my next interview, uh, have a good day, Mark. Um, and thanks so much for coming on. I really, Austin, I really appreciate it. Thanks for showing interest in our film and helping get the word out. We're, we're super stoked that we're premiering the film and uh, very excited and hopefully, hopefully it's a good, a good strong year for all films of this magnitude. Yeah. Let's um, yeah. Let's hope. I, I, I really love how slam dance does a bunch of indie movies. So yeah, I, I really hope people see your film. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a super exciting festival filmmaker festival for filmmakers. Um, and they're incredible. I, I'm, I'll be there watching every one of the films and supporting the filmmakers, and um, we appreciate support. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thanks, Austin. Thanks.